What if I told you that as a PA or an NP, there was a place that you could work where you could choose to move around between practicing clinically or doing non-clinical work like regulatory work for the FDA or policy administration with CMS or even research with the CDC. You could stay in one location or you could choose to work in various states around the US and sometimes even having the opportunity to work overseas, all while staying with the same employer, gaining seniority and raises along the way. Are you thinking that that seems impossible? Well, the job does exist, and today we're gonna to explore what that opportunity is. So stay tuned if you find that intriguing. Hi, it's Michelle with The Medicine Couch. Thanks for joining me on another adventure as I uncover unique and cool jobs in medicine. Well, my name is Philip LaFleur, and I was a physician assistant for 21 years. Uh, I went to school in my 40s. It was a second career for me, and I'm retired now, I retired in 2019. I worked for the federal government for my entire PA career. Well, great. Thank you, Philip. I appreciate you joining us today. I'm excited. I'm very excited to be talking about my career. So tell us a little bit about your path. I was a medic in the Air Force for six years, and I was a medic in the Army National Guard for four years. When I graduated from PA school, I had trouble finding a job. And I was living in Nashville. There's a lot of medical programs in Nashville. And my wife said, you need to cast a wider net. And I had a friend who had done a preceptorship at the Bureau of Prisons. So I applied and they, they hired me. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just wanted to get some experience. And once I was working in the Bureau of Prisons, I transferred to the United States Public Health Service. So you started off as a civilian uh, employee with the, the government, but then you learned about this Public Health Service Commission Corps. And so that's what I want you to tell us a little bit more about. I, I contacted the prison in March of 19... 99. And I went for my interview in May of 1999. And that's when I saw the, the naval uniforms, which turned out to be the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps officers. And there are a lot of them in the federal prison system, probably four or 500. And many of them work in the prison hospitals because the Public Health Service has pharmacists, registered nurses, psychologists, doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners, lab. And when I saw the uniforms, I talked to one of the physical therapists who was a high ranking PHS officer. And he's like, well, they're PHS officers. That's a different career track. He said, you can be a civil servant or you can be United States Public Health Service. We work side by side primarily in 11 federal agencies, but there are a lot of other uh, you know, possibilities. It, it's just kind of difficult to really give it all in a quick explanation. But I said, well, I was prior military. And he's like, you need to be a PHS officer because all the years you spent in the military will count toward your retirement. So I had six years Air Good Force. Yeah. So I went in with six years toward pay and, and allowances so I just wanted to make this clear. First of all, I want you, can, can you tell us what the whole, the, the actual, just official name of the Commission Corps, like what is the name? Starting with the Department of Health and Human Services, there is a group called the Public Health Service. And there's about 50,000 people in the Public Health Service. And they work in a variety of jobs in the Department of Health and Human Services. And the Commission Corps is about 6,000, between 6,000 and 6,500 commissioned officers who are serving in uniform, just like the Coast Guard, the Army, the Navy, the Marines. It's the same pay. It's the same allowances. It's the same criteria for service. So you wear a naval style uniform, but you wear different insignia and you have different ribbons that are awarded by the public health service. So it's within the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's a component of the public health service. So we were spread out over 11 different federal agencies alongside civilians doing exactly the same job. But you were actually like a member of you. you the Commission Corps is. Um, it's a career. Is it considered track. a military? But is it considered a military branch uh, or no? Unarmed force. An unarmed so, force, okay. Uniform service. 
Uniform that's, a, service. that's a great that's a great way to make money in a bar. How many uniform services are there? Everybody will say five, but there's actually seven. Um, so, well, wait, wait, we, no, but you got to tell us what the seven are before we move on. <laughs> oh, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, United States Public Health Service, and even tinier, even less well known, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. Oh, okay. Yeah. We provide their psychologists, we provide their doctors, nurses, PAs. But we being, the, being the Commission Corps? Uh, Public Health Service, Commission Corps, yeah. And, yeah. and we also work for the Coast Guard. So you can, you can be assigned to a Coast Guard station as a PHS officer and then wear a Coast Guard style uniform with PHS insignia. It becomes very com convoluted. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just to, to basically, just to, to, to summarize this, so the, the Public Health Service Commission Corps is a uniformed service, so similar to to enlisting or going in commissioned, you know, into one of the, the armed forces, you're going in as a commissioned officer in this uniformed service. So you have, you know, all of the the kind of rules and regiments and stuff that you think of in in a uniformed service that you have to right. follow, right? Now, yeah. can you be, can you, do you get like deployed or you, do you get to, to pick your assignments when you're in the, the, the Commission Corps? You can pick assignments. You can also be assigned somewhere involuntarily. It all just depends on your particular situation and what the time frame is, because there's been a lot of different permutations of the, of the United States Public Health Service mm -hmm. Commission Corps. Uh, but currently, I would say it's probably 90-10 where you pick your own mm -hmm. assignment versus you get assigned somewhere. People coming out of school who immediately get a commission are often sent where most needed. Okay. But the beauty of the job is once you work anywhere two years, you can apply to transfer. Oh, okay. And when people ask me about federal service, both civil service and PHS, I tell them, find the job no one wants and get that job and get onboarded, go through that process, which can take six to nine months to become a federal employee, do your two years of servitude and then go where you really want to go. Okay, so we, we kind of talked about what the Public Health Service Commission Corps is, this um, uniformed service that you are going into. We talked about the fact that you can choose to some extent, um, assignments, especially once you, you know, have been working with them for a little while. Uh, and what, one thing I had asked that I wasn't, that I don't think we got to was, was can you be, when you're, when you're in the Commission Corps, can you be deployed somewhere? And if so, then, then what are those circumstances? Not against your will. You okay. have to accept the deployment. Oh, okay. So they put out a call for deployments, people volunteer, some people are approached, can you deploy, will you deploy? And, you know, if you're a mom with small children or if you're mission critical at your job or if you're infirm or, you know, in terms of that particular time period, you can't be infirm and stay in the public health service. You have to be healthy, physically fit, height, weight, portion it, but, I deployed whenever I could because I loved it. It's a, it's, you know, it can be grueling because you're in um, Spartan circumstances and it's 12 hour shifts and it's seven days a week, but it's a fantastic opportunity to really feel like you're having a genuine impact on the public health. What examples can you give us of what you were deployed to? I went to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I was in Chalmette, Louisiana. A lot of people don't realize there were five hurricanes that season that pretty much wiped out the Gulf Coast. There were just hundreds of thousands of people who were, you know, uh, affected. And what we did was we just set up a free clinic. We saw everybody. So we saw all the, all the federal workers. We saw the relief workers. We saw the locals. We saw people from FEMA who had their own camp where they were actually housing people in tents who had come down like they were like uh, volunteers there were hundreds of volunteers and and there were small groups like trying to rescue animals and there were hippies and there were people preaching and everybody came and we saw as many as 175 people in a single day it was wow 
<laughs> me and three doctors. And the PHS officers were sprinkled through the team. The overall commander was the nurse practitioner who was a, a captain in the PHS, and she ran the whole clinic. So the civilian doctors reported to her in her capacity. But she was answering to the local commander for disaster relief under the Department of Health and Human Services. So that was one of them. Another, and this is a more interesting one, I went to Liberia for two months to work in an Ebola treatment clinic. And the federal government has thousands and thousands of medical professionals on call who are capable of being utilized. They're called DMAT. And they can respond, but they work civilian jobs. And then they get time off from their civilian jobs to respond to disasters. But they cannot be sent overseas by law. Okay. They can only be utilized in the United States. So the government tried to use the Army and the Navy to work in Liberia to shore up the infrastructure there, which was overwhelmed. But they didn't have the kind of medical resources that the public health service has. So when the president of Liberia came to Obama and said, I need someone to set up a clinic for healthcare workers because we can't get anybody to send healthcare workers to Liberia, he asked his advisors, who do we have? And they said, well, we got the public health service. So they sent a team of 75. We took a army mobile hospital. Actually, I think it was an Air Force mobile hospital. It was about to be uh, decommissioned because it had reached the end of its serviceable life because it was going to be destroyed when we were done. You know, they weren't going to try yeah. to salvage it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, let's bring Ebola <laughs> back. <laughs> we it into an Ebola clinic. And we spent two months there. And I went to uh, Hurricane uh, Maria and Hurricane Irma in Miami. We took care of people from the Keys who were infirm. It's exciting to be able to help people and to go where there's need. But it's always there's always something kind of special, I think, about being involved in moments of history. And it's got to be a pretty special feeling and, and a, a lot of sense of fulfillment in your, your mission as a PA. It was my favorite. You know, I went to El Paso and I examined the children of asylum seekers who were coming through the border patrol, you know, because they had had some children die and they wanted people to be examined to make sure that we didn't have a repeat of that. Kids had died in custody. Yeah. So that was under uh, the, you know, under the auspices of border patrol and ICE. But yeah, it's, it's, it was my favorite thing, really, yeah. getting that opportunity. But you don't have to go. Right. You're asked, you can always say no. You can be asked to move to a different job in the federal government or move in, in the PHS. The, the caveat is you don't have to move, but moving helps your career. Yeah. It looks good on your resume. You don't have to deploy, but deployment helps your career. So when you're in the Public Health Service Commission Corps, um, I assume the um, you're so you're paid on a grade level. You said earlier, it depends on on what grade you're at. Um, but overall, does that salary um, or your pace is it is it comparable to like civilian PA pay or how does that how does that work? The way I've explained it to people is it's. Uh... It's kind of like two intersecting lines. One is much steeper than the other. So when you work as a civil servant, you might start off as a physician assistant, GS 11, step one, you might be like 55, 60, 65,000. But as time goes by and you work your way up to GS 11, step 10 or GS 12, uh, your pay will go up comparably and you might end up at like in the 90s or around a hundred thousand over the course of a career so we're talking about in today's today's like if you were joining today there are some jobs that are only paying 55 60 thousand in the commission corps no that's oh, okay. civil service oh civil service okay mission corps yeah. you start off actually a little bit lower but with each promotion and as time goes by and you add more years your pay goes up dramatically. So like each time I got promoted, my pay went up anywhere from a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a month. 
So the people who I worked with who were longtime PHS officers always made substantially more than their civil service counterparts. The supervisor in the pharmacy and the supervisor of the lab at the prison I worked at were both civilians. They were the lowest paid people in their departments mm -hmm. because the people who worked for them were lieutenant commanders, commanders, captains with many years in the PHS. Uh, when I was in the FDA in Massachusetts, the three highest paid people, I mean, 140, 150,000 a year were senior captains. They made more than the director of the the entire branch. Uh, so the pay starts off a little bit lower, but the benefits kind of make up for that because the benefits are better in PHS than they are in civil service. They're not bad in civil service. But they're not like free medical, free dental, 30 days paid vacation, unlimited sick leave. I mean, it's much more judicious when you're a civil servant. PHS is like the military. You're giving up a tremendous amount. Like I said, you sign away your civil rights. You can't go to HR if you're a uniformed service officer. You can't file a complaint. You know, you're a uniformed service. You're a commissioned corps officer. You, you just got to suck it up. And you have to do whatever you're told to do whenever you're told to do it. My supervisor used to make a joke. I could make you go out and sweep the parking lot and you'd have to do it. I'd say, yeah, but I don't have to stay in this job. I could transfer. Yeah. And then he'd get all huffy with me. Yeah. But it's a it's a trade off. Yeah. But that trade off is it ends up being pretty lucrative later on in your career. So you kind of have to recognize those those quantum leaps that you have in in pay and benefits i mean my roommate made captain and he's making like one hundred and sixty thousand a year now a pretty good chunk of that is untaxed you know my my base pay when i retired my base pay was seventy thousand dollars a year but my untaxed benefit for housing was about thirty eight thousand so I was only paying taxes on 70, but I was making 108. Okay. You know yeah, so that's starting that. to sound a little bit better because I think it's a hard pill for people to ask people to swallow to think about, you know, as a PA, you routinely nowadays, most people are probably around 110, when, well, the average is 115. Um, but, you know, most people are, especially if you have any kind of years of experience, you know, are making 120 or, or more um, to sure. ask them to go to a job that's making half that, um, you know, in, in salary is, is pretty difficult. But I, I see what you're saying is if you can stick with it and you, you know, put in the years, then it starts going up exponentially. And then you've got those benefits. Having a good portion of your income not taxed is a pretty big deal in the long run. I don't have a pension. You don't have to invest any money. I mean, people do put money in the thrift savings plan, which is the federal retirement account, but you get a pension anywhere from 50 to 75% of your base pay when you retire, in addition to your social security, because we pay in social security just like everyone else does. Yeah. What we used to say amongst ourselves is you don't join the PHS for the money. Yeah. Now it ends up being, uh, you know, a good paying job, you know, in the later years, but when you join the PHS, you join because of the opportunity to serve the American public. And we really took that to heart. You won't thrive, you won't survive if you don't want to do that job because it's yeah. not for people who are just trying to make money. Yeah. Uh, just that that person typically just doesn't make it in the PHS. They leave very quickly. Yeah. Because it's a job that makes tremendous demands on you, and especially early on, doesn't pay all that well. But the job satisfaction, I mean, I went to work every day at the FDA, and I protected the American public from, you know, dishonest manufacturers and from products that were not safe. And, I mean, we did a really good job of it. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the FDA a little bit more because I think that's yeah, that's fascinating. But um, can you give us some um, more examples of other agencies or places that you can choose to work in if you're in the Public Health Service Commission Corps? It breaks down uh, that the Indian Health Service has the vast majority of PHS officers. Uh, anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 on any given day could be working in the Indian Health Service 
on reservations, clinics, hospitals that are devoted to taking care of Native Americans. The next largest contingent is FDA, and there's about probably 12 or 1300 give or take. The third largest would probably be the CDC with less than a thousand, about seven or eight hundred, and the Bureau of Prisons has about five hundred, and it tapers off from that. Uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, the CMS uh, is another one in Baltimore. They hire a lot of people. Um, SAMHSA, but the basic job, most of these agencies have a basic job that generally just requires some science. But it, it can be daunting trying to find the job and get the job. It takes months to get in. But boy, once you're in, it's it's a dream, I think. But when we're talking specifically about PAs and, and NPs, it, se- it seems like that they could choose clinical routes like the Indian Health Service or you know working in the, the prisons. But if they are looking for non-clinical jobs in ways that they can still use their degree and stuff, it seems like that the Public Health Service uh, Commission Corps has lots of options for those people as well. Yes, absolutely. And that's something I've said online in the PA groups I belong to on Reddit and uh, and on Facebook. People say, I'm burnt out. I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, man, there are thousands and thousands of non-clinical jobs in the federal government. You just need to do the research. State governments have the same type of opportunities, but they're hard jobs to find. They're hard jobs to get. And that the advice that's the advice I was giving earlier. You got to find the job nobody wants. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I applied for all these jobs and I didn't get any. Well, you're applying for jobs that people that already work for that agency are dreaming about having. You need to apply for the job nobody wants. Go to that reservation that's four hours from a metropolitan center. They'll take you. You know, do your two years of indentured servitude and then you can go to Washington, D.C. or you can go to Boston or Dallas, Fort Worth or wherever and get the dream job that you wanted. You just got to do it in a way that you can get into the door. Yeah. You know, and that's really something that I think a lot of people don't stop to think about. It's very hard to get a federal job. So is there, um, because it's a, um, a uniform service, is there like any kind of age restrictions, either age that you can join or age that you have to retire, anything like that? You have to be under 37 years old from what I remember when I came on board. Now that may be different now, but yeah, there, and you have to be height, weight, proportionate. You have to be uh, healthy, can't have like chronic illness. If you have a heart murmur, if you have diabetes, you're going to have to go through a physical and a dental exam and you have to pass those in order to get in. Because it's a a uniform service, do you have to sign up for like certain time commitments? (laughs) Do you know what I'm asking? Like, you know, can you resign at any time? There are programs where the United States Public Health Service, like the other uniform services, will pay for your training. Or there are loan reimbursement programs that you can get into. Uh uh, And those require that you serve a certain number of, it's like like they're paying you, basically. I had a nurse who was a friend who worked out in the Indian Health Service, and she had $20,000 a year of her student loans paid off. You know, but she had to serve an extra year in the uniform services in order to pay back that year. You know, she got eighty thousand dollars paid off. She was going to stay anyway, so why not? Yeah. You know? So if you're looking for, like, if people are just want to look for a job with the federal government as a civilian in these different agencies, where they go to the USAjobs.gov, right? But how do people, or where do people go to to enlist and learn more about the Public Health Service Commission Corps? There's a website for the Commission Corps. Some okay, systems. I'll look it up and I'll put it down below. Yeah. Yeah, that's that would be the place to start. Like now they have open and closed periods for various career fields, various categories, we call them categories. So they'll hire nurses for three months and then they'll hire doctors for two months and then they'll hire, you know, uh, lab techs for three months. And it just there's you have to apply when there's an open season, you know, when it when they're taking applications for that career field. It's very much a self governed kind of career field too. You, you're you a one-man show and you're not going to have a command structure. There's not going to be a first sergeant. There's not going to be a commanding officer. You're going to be a commissioned officer 
and you're going to be working a job alongside civilians and the only people you really have to count on on yourself and the senior commission officers who work in your agency that you can turn to you know every agency has a commission corps liaison and you can contact the liaison and say this is what i'm trying to accomplish and there's a million things you have to try to accomplish involving employment and transfer children career you know your pay allowances whatever and they help you they walk you through it and there's a there's a headquarters you can go to there's people you can call a headquarters and say this is what i'm trying to do how do i do it yeah you know so it's very much self-directed and it that's another aspect of it that a lot of people don't like so it sounds like that uh working for the public health service and especially being in the commission corps has a lot of great things going for it you know we admit right off it's not the the path you're going to go if you want big money especially right away it's going to be one of those situations where you're going to have to go in lower but knowing if this is the path that you will eventually work your way up and you'll get along the way lots of other perks and a lot of great benefits and then have that pension after being vested after five years which is something that you're not going to find for the most part out in the civilian world but it also sounds like something that's a great could be a great path for people who are looking for a career that's going to give them the option to have lots of variety to do lots of different things if they wanted to and potentially could give you the opportunity to actually move and live in different parts of the United States if that's something you're interested in. Absolutely. Yeah. The the three things I would add are if you're prior service, if you're prior service, it's the perfect job because you pick up all your prior time and you've already kind of proven yourself in that environment. Um, The second thing I would say is the, the camaraderie. It's a very small community. So you get to know, I knew or I knew of pretty much every PA. There were only about 175 of us in the PHS. So I was close friends with many of them, acquaintances with another large number, and I knew about the newest ones coming in. The third thing is the esprit de corps, just being a member of a small elite uniform service. You take a lot of pride in what you do. Those three things, I think, really are critical to the person who might want to be a PHS officer. The money is great. The benefits are great. The retirement is amazing, but it it really pales in comparison to what drives you day to day. I look forward to going to work every day. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, you can't ask for much more than that in, in a career is to have that that satisfaction and that that joy and the love for your job and everything else is kind of just bonus on top of that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Philip, for joining us today and sharing all of your stories and, and letting us know about this unique opportunity that I'm sure most PAs and NPs don't even really know about. I love the PHS. I love talking about it. I love talking, period. So I'm really, <laughs> really excited. I was really excited to have an opportunity to share this because I hope that it will reach someone who's at that interface in their career where this might be a good option for them. But by and large, I backed into the greatest career that I think anybody's ever had. I truly believe that the Public Health Service Commission Corps can offer the right person a unique career and terrific early retirement. There's a lot to consider here, so if you found this intriguing at all, don't forget to check the description box below for the link to get more information about this opportunity. Now, when I was interviewing Philip, he also told me all about what he did at the FDA and some of the incredibly unique experiences that you can have as a PA. When I get that video edited, I'm going to link it here at the end. Thanks for watching, and as always, take care, stay sane, and I'll see you next time on The Medicine Couch. Bye!